welcome to this uh, uh, first lecture in week 7 so i will start i'll just reprise some stuff that we have learned uh, during phase change in unary in unary so we uh, discussed unary systems right and and in a unary system we discussed something called phase change so phase change and phase equilibria in unary system so we looked at these so for phase change as you know and we also looked at the phase diagrams in unary systems and we uh, remember that the phase diagrams uh, we drew in usually you can draw different types of phase diagrams mu t v t but in general um, uh, the phase diagrams that are drawn are having pressure pressure as the y axis and temperature as the x axis and we also saw some sort of uh, like a triple points and all this stuff and we looked at, uh, at means how the phases will coexist and all and we if you remember we told that uh, we introduced Gaussian Kaplan equation and we told that the dp dt that is a slope of the phase boundary slope of the phase boundary here for any transformation say for example you have three phases you have say gamma phase here beta gamma, uh, alpha phase here beta, beta phase so gamma is here and beta is here so uh, you are telling that in such a case gamma alpha phase boundary or gamma beta phase boundary or uh, alpha beta phase boundary the slopes will be given by clausius clapeyron equation okay so this is something that we discussed but i just want to reprise because we want to see for different types of systems for example a uh, system that contains only condensed phases like for example solid liquid transformation or uh, let us look at liquid vapor transformation or solid vapor transformation such as sublimation how does the phase boundary slope how does the slope of the phase boundary change okay so we have to look at what is the slope of the phase boundary this is basically a reprise of the last lecture so slope of the phase boundary how do you calculate you first uh, you first know that if two phases are in coexistence right or they are in equilibrium alpha and beta are in equilibrium then g alpha has to be equal to g beta g alpha the free energy of alpha phase has to be equal to the free energy of the beta phase at any given pressure temperature combination which is along the phase boundary right so basically here so if, let us look at these points so for example if i am looking at a point here alpha and beta are in coexistence at this temperature at this temperature and at this pressure right this is the pressure this is the temperature at which at this point alpha and beta are in equilibrium again let us let us look at this point if you look at this point and then this is the pressure and this is the temperature right at which alpha and beta will be in equilibrium right so for example so so um, or say for example at this point again you have this pressure and this is your temperature right that at, at this point so along the phase boundary all points represent the equilibrium between alpha and beta at right along the phase boundary all points each point along the phase boundary points represent equilibrium between alpha and beta and the equilibrium between alpha and beta corresponds to a certain pressure and a certain temperature so if in such a case as you know g alpha equals to g beta now you have only uh, it's a unary system so it's a unary system that means you are basically look at, if you are looking at partial uh, means if you are looking at the chemical potential chemical potential is nothing but the so in this case the chemical potential of alpha say chemical potential of some component there is no other component there is only one component so the chemical potential is nothing but mu is nothing but gm that is the molar free energy right mu is basically molar free energy so mu alpha that means is the molar free energy of alpha phase equals to molar free energy of beta phase now as you know that d mu alpha this is something that we know right that uh, means this is from the dg equals to vdp minus sdt right we know dg we know we have done this uh, dg 
equals to VDP minus SDT. See, there is a plus mu dn, but here n equal to means that basically there is only one component. So if I if I divide by n, then what we get? If I divide by n, n is the number of moles of that component. Then dg by n, which is basically g by n here is nothing but mu equal to Vm. Vm basically is the molar volume Vm dp minus s dt or you can also write a sm dt is basically the small s which lowercase s basically represents lowercase s basically represents the, uh, the the entropy per mole right so the entropy per mole so this is coming from dg equals to vdp minus stt okay so if i have and then you have also mu dn here but as you know that you have only n moles of component one so if you divide by uh, n on all sides then basically n by n is nothing but 1 and d of 1 is 0, right? So basically, d mu equals to v alpha, v, vm dp minus uh, lowercase s dt and lowercase s represents the molar entropy. So, so basically, mu alpha represents molar Gibbs free energy of alpha phase. This is molar entropy of alpha phase. This is molar volume of alpha phase. Similarly, for beta, this is molar Gibbs free energy of beta phase molar entropy of beta phase and molar volume of beta phase and you have d mu alpha equals to d mu beta d mu alpha equals to d mu beta so you get minus s alpha dt alpha so if this is so then these equal to this right these and these are equal so this equals to this so if that is so minus s alpha dt alpha plus vm alpha dp alpha equals to minus s beta dt beta plus vm beta dp beta now as you know at equilibrium the pressures have to be equal right for all phases all the phases that are existing the pressures have to be equal right it, uh, it ha there should be no difference in pressure right if you remove all the internal constraints right this we have proved uh, for different subsystems or different phases that are basically separated by phase boundaries and these phase boundaries are basically like constraints and if you remove all internal constraints basically you make the the, the boundary flexible that is uh, uh, responsive to volume change and the boundary is diathermal and the boundary is uh, uh, permeable to diffusion or mass transfer again here there is no mass transfer because there is only one component or one species available but this comes from mechanical equilibrium right this is basically nothing but the mechanical equilibrium that pressures so since alpha and beta are in equilibrium therefore the pressures inside alpha and inside beta have to be equal when the alpha when alpha and beta are in equilibrium similarly there is thermal equilibrium right so this is coming from mechanical equilibrium mechanical equilibrium and this is coming from thermal equilibrium now see there is no additional species this is a unary system so you have only mechanical and thermal equilibrium to consider right because uh, the, the 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 chemical equilibrium which is for each species is not required right here it is not required it's a unary system now if you see then p alpha and p beta are basically same as p right some common value p and t alpha and t beta are equal and they are equal to some common value t so then if you rearrange you get this if you rearrange you get this vm beta minus vm alpha dp equals to s beta minus s alpha dt so now vm beta minus vm alpha is delta vm alpha to beta right vm beta minus vm alpha is basically according to our convention that is the delta vm that is change in molar volume when there is a transformation from alpha to beta right delta vm alpha to beta note that this is very important to note delta vm alpha to beta is just the negative of delta vm according to our convention beta to alpha because alpha to beta means the way we calculate alpha to beta basically sorry so the, the 
Hmm. Yeah. So delta V m alpha to beta equals to minus delta V m beta to alpha, and delta V m alpha to beta is nothing but V m beta minus V m alpha, while this is equal to so this is this, and uh, this is basically V m alpha minus V m beta. See, so look at the arrow sign. If you look at the arrow sign, then you will see. So beta to alpha. So it is like. So basically, beta to alpha transformation. How much is the volume change? So then, then what we are doing? V m alpha minus V m beta. If it is alpha to beta transformation, it is V m beta minus V m alpha. I think now you are very clear with this. So if you are clear, then you see if you arrange this right. So uh, here we are looking at V m beta minus V m alpha, which is basically delta V m alpha to beta, right? Because final Final is final minus initial, or you can think of like final state minus initial st state. Obviously, remember this is a at the transmission temperature at a given pressure at at different pressures and temperatures. Basically, alpha and beta are in equilibrium, right? It's a reversible equilibrium along the phase boundary, right? Both are in coexistence, but depending on the convention, so you can use Vm uh, delta Vm beta to alpha. Then this will be also delta s beta to alpha. Right, delta is that means entropy of transformation, molar entropy of transformation from beta to uh, alpha to beta, or uh, it uh, you can write it as beta to alpha. So it does not really matter. So this is basically what I am trying to say is that if you write this way, delta is beta to alpha and delta V M beta to alpha, it does not really matter because the negative sign that is there. On both sides, uh, on 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 the numerator there is a negative sign. On the denominator there is a negative sign. So they are basically getting cancelled out. And this is called the famous Clausius-Clapeyron equation. And that is the equation of the phase boundary, right? It gives the slope of the phase boundary. As you can see again, that this is pressure temperature, and the slope of the phase boundary, the slope of the phase boundary, is this one, right? I go to any point, and if I have to draw a slope, I'll draw a tangent, right? And that. Tangent line will make a slope, and that is the slope, right? This is the slope, and that slope is nothing but dP by dt, right? Because you have pressure y and x are so. If you have y and x, so this is y axis, this is x axis. dy dx is the slope, right, of the x y curve. So dy dx at any point is the slope of the x y curve. See, so exactly that's what we have written. dP dt is the slope of the pressure temperature, uh, the, the 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 pressure temperature. Curve that delineates the phase boundary, right? So the phase boundary that delineates the co the equilibrium coexistence between alpha and beta basically has a slope of dP by dt, which is given by the ratio of molar entropy of transformation from alpha to beta or beta to alpha by uh, or uh, by the ratio uh, the, the the molar volume the change in molar volume during transformation from beta to alpha or from alpha to beta. Right, so th this is the ratio. So, so the the slope depends on this ratio. Now, let us think of the solid liquid boundary. First, let us look at the solid liquid boundary. So, you can at the solid liquid boundary at different pressures, you will have different melting or freezing point. Right, you can call it either melting point or freezing point again because it's a reversible thing. So, as alpha alpha say for example alpha is solid and beta is liquid. So, if solid Transforms to liquid, it's called melting, and while liquid transforms to solid, it's called freezing. Right. So now again, mu alpha equals to mu beta. Now mu alpha is nothing but h alpha minus T s alpha. Again, h alpha is the enthalpy per mole of alpha. H beta is enthalpy per mole of beta, and s is entropy per mole of alpha, and s beta is entropy per mole of Beta. So, as you can see, H beta minus H alpha equals to T S beta minus S alpha. Now, what is this T? The T, this T is the temperature at which alpha and beta are in equilibrium. And in solid liquid bound, uh, in the solid liquid uh, coexistence, the temperature at which they are in equilibrium at different pressures are called the melting point or the freezing point, right? So, basically, this T is going to be this T. You can call it T M, or you can call it also T transformation, right? T transformation, T T R or T M, right? This is the T. But what you are saying is H beta minus H alpha. See, there is a nice relation that you get. H beta minus H alpha. That is the 
enthalpy of transformation from alpha to beta right enthalpy of transformation from alpha to beta equals to t times entropy of transformation from alpha to beta again each, each quantity is calculated per mole okay so basically now you can rewrite this as dp by dt equals to delta s alpha to beta to delta vm alpha to beta now delta s you are replacing by delta h alpha to beta by t delta vm alpha to beta what is t t is basically ttr or tm now basically remember tm0 let us let let us call tm0 so let us think of this as tm0 is the melting temperature at pressure p0 that means tm0 is the equilibrium or coexistence temperature between alpha and beta solid phase and liquid phase and that is nothing but the melting temperature or freezing temperature similarly let us consider tm as the melting temperature or freezing temperature or the coexistence temperature or the transformation temperature at pressure at some pressure p now if we assume that delta h alpha beta and delta vm alpha beta does not means do not vary with t then we can just integrate Clausius Clapeyron equation. So remember, so that's why I avoided writing TTR because you have this dt and dt by t and then I will put this limits, right, dt by t. So instead of writing here directly dttr, we know that this is the transformation temperature. This t is the transformation temperature at different pressures, right, t is transformation temperature at pressure p. at some pressure p prime say let us at some pressure p prime okay maybe we can call it t prime and put a t prime so t prime is transformation temperature at pressure p prime now if you see you have this dt by t or dt prime by t prime so basically this is like ln t and here you have p and you have p minus p0 and as i told you delta is alpha beta and delta vm alpha beta if we assume that they do not vary with uh, pressure or uh, or uh, temperature and this is a it, it has it is reasonable because both are condensed phases so there is not much change with pressure so there is pv work is negligible right so as a result you can just write it as uh, so this integral can be written from this equation from this equation you can write this integral right this integral and you can put the limits tm0 tm as you can see when it is tm0 pressure is p0 and when it is tm pressure is p so if you now plug it in you get p equals to p0 plus delta h alpha to beta by delta vm alpha to beta ln tm by tm0 right so if tm by tm0 if tm minus tm0 is small then ln tm by tm0 can be approximated as ln 1 plus tm minus tm0 by tm0 and basically i take only the linear term because tm minus tm0 is small i take only the linear term it is like ln 1 plus x so if i do ln 1 plus x where x is small we can write is as x plus x square by 2 factorial and stuff but x is small so x square will be even smaller so basically i can just take the first term there is a linear term in the expansion which is tm minus tm0 by tm0 and that is basically tm minus tm0 is nothing but the change in melting temperature due to change in pressure so change in melting temperature due to change in pressure now you can see a very nice relation you get p minus p0 so basically which is like delta p so i can write this as delta p equals to delta h alpha to beta and then i can put a temperature tm naught okay so that is my reference temperature and this is delta vm alpha to beta into delta t so you can basically if i know the change in melting temperature i can estimate the change in pressure or if it is change in pressure i can estimate the change in melting temperature basically i can directly write dp dt as delta h by t delta v and if delta h and t delta v are basically the if delta h and delta v are independent of temperature so they do they come out of the integration right they come out of the integration but if you want to do more generalized uh, integration for example you think of this epsilon to beta transformation in titanium epsilon to beta so epsilon is hcp phase okay at lower temperature you have epsilon phase and at higher temperatures okay and for different pressures you can have bcc phase so you have hcp phase you have bcc phase and there is a transformation temperature ti 
okay now if you think of this now let us write this way so what is the in the pressure temperature diagram what is the slope delta hm that is the molar enthalpy of transmission from epsilon to beta divided by t t is the transition temperature mm, uh, times um, delta vm that is the change in molar volume from epsilon to beta right so now delta lgm epsilon to beta is again as i don't want to confuse you and it's a function of temperature and pressure note that this can be so we told in the last approximation that del let us assume that delta h alpha to beta is not a function of temperature and pressure delta vm is not a function of pressure and temperature so then it becomes a very very simple relation right this relation right many other times we use this relation however if we tell no delta hm is a function of temperature and pressure that is it will also change with temperature and pressure so basically what does it mean hm beta is also a function of temperature and pressure and hm epsilon is also a function of temperature and pressure now if that is so now you have delta hm epsilon to beta is nothing but hm beta minus hm epsilon right this is how we have looked at right beta is the final state this is the initial state so this will be final minus initial now if i do differential that is d of delta hm is dhm minus dhm uh, dhm beta minus dhm epsilon now dh again this comes from Mac, uh, applying maxwell's relation and uh, doing further simplification okay so i'll i'll take um, uh, so if you do this uh, approximation so i'll just um, uh, skip once i just want to tell you what is the genesis of this so if you want to see that you can think of by the way this is something i haven't told so it is something that is used i haven't told this previously when i taught maxwell's relation that you have to basically ultimately maxwell's relation is basically equating the second derivatives right so if you look at maxwell so it's called maxwell relations so max born uh, basically when he looked at this maxwell relations and i think uh, you are also having some difficulty in remembering right because you have to equate stuff so basically this uh, so max born uh, created this mnemonics there are 100 versions of this there are different versions of this so he created this mnemonics where he starts from g and he goes this is a thermodynamic square so you go good physicists have studied under very fine teachers so you can see g p h s good physicists have studied under very fine teachers right so if you look at that now if you see then if you, I want to go for for say I want to write a differential say I take this h okay I take this h I directly get v so when I use h I will take the two signs here so dh equals to vdp plus so you have tds right you have vdp plus tds right and also you can look at so remember in the differential so when it comes to the only only differential thing that comes in is here so the sign of the differential so minus s is there so there is a d of minus s and there is a uh, vdp here and tds here as you can see here h has s and p here and v and t here so v will come here and t will come here see both are positive but when it comes to differentials you ignore the sign okay you ignore the sign so you get vdp plus tds again uh, when you have differentials you ignore the sign so del s del p t is equal to so if you see this del s del p t equals to minus del v del t p why minus because p is now not part of the differential right p is not a part of the differential but if you can see this when i am looking at del s del p okay and then i am fixing when i am looking at these then i am fixing this right so del s del p t equals to now i have this right if i have this then i will take this so this becomes del v del t but there is a minus p because if i take the opposite one then i have a negative sign here so this becomes minus del v del t of p right now you know ds is del s del t so I have taken basically this thing. So I have taken S is a function of temperature and pressure. Then I am basically using the exact differential. So I am writing ds equals del s del t dt plus del s del p dp. Again, del s del t is evaluated at constant pressure. And del s del t p we have already shown. And it's very easy. So it comes from here. dh 
equals to TDS, right, which is equal to CPDT. So basically, if DH is TDS, then uh, uh, then basically del S by del T, right, so because TDS is CPDT, so DS by DT is CP by T or del S by del T equal to CP by T at constant pressure, right, at constant pressure. So now this is equals to minus del V del T P, which comes from the Maxwell relation minus del V del P, P and that is nothing but because um, alpha is nothing but alpha equal to 1 by V del V del T P, right, and this comes out to be, so then this becomes minus del V del T P, again, remember, when you apply thermodynamic square, only in the constant terms that you are having here, you are applying the signs, right, that negative signs, otherwise, it is just, uh, you ignore the signs, and del S del P is nothing but del V del T. You can do it for various cases and you can equate the second, uh, the, 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 the second derivatives and you can see that you can derive all the Maxwell's relations. But you go for the simplification because what I have done, I have expressed this now, del S del P I have expressed in terms of measurable quantity, del S del T I have expressed in terms of measurable quantities, right. This is all measurable, this is all measurable. So then I write DH, right, which is TDS right, ds, I am now expressing this, right, this is basically nothing but ds, so tds plus vdp, so basically this is, uh, so you have cpdt, ccpdt, t into t, uh, t, 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 t times 1 by t, this cancels, so basically this becomes cpdt, and this is minus v alpha, and this is, there is a v here, there is a v minus v alpha multiplied by t, so, so I can take v common and becomes 1 minus t alpha t, so basically, as you can see here, as you can see here, dH is CPDT plus V 1 minus T alpha TP. Now, if that is so, you apply this, you apply this uh, relation and you get back, you get back. So, basically, I am going back to the slide here. So, this is nothing but this is the relation that I have used, right. And remember, what I have done? I have differentiated the delta HM, right. So, delta HM is nothing but differentiate the dhm beta dhm epsilon so d delta hm epsilon to beta is nothing but delta cp dt right this has a delta cp right because dh equals to cp dt but this is epsilon to beta so delta cp is cp beta minus cp epsilon see cp the heat capacity of at constant pressure of the beta phase and heat capacity of constant pressure at the of the epsilon phase and you have delta cp dt plus delta V into 1 minus T alpha dp. Now, as you can see for condensed phases, delta this change in molar volume, uh, this quantity change in this quantity is Vm beta 1 minus T alpha beta and this is Vm epsilon 1 minus T alpha epsilon. You for condensed phases, this term is very, very negligible, right, because the pressure changes up to 10 to the power 5 bar, which is like 10 GPA. So, up to 10 GPA pressure, you can neglect this term. Up to 10 GPA pressure, you can neglect this term. Basically, the, so the term associated with DP can be neglected because the change in pressure, if unless you go to like 10 GPA, you do not have a very big influence of that. So, then basically, practically for condensed phases, DH is nothing but CPDT. But here, as you can see, DH is a function of Cp and T and Cp itself, by the way, can be a function of temperature, right? Cp itself, so basically D delta H epsilon to beta, that is this, this is the enthalpy of transmission, the molar enthalpy. So, if I can put like here M, then this becomes molar heat capacity. So, that the D delta H, that is the differential of the entropy of transmission from epsilon to beta is nothing but delta Cp molar, this is the change the, the change in molar heat capacity when uh, phase transforms from epsilon to beta uh, times dt right so basically now cp we can write so for each phase we can write cp is nothing but a plus bt plus c by t square plus dt square this comes from this comes from experimental data see i am sh giving you recipes to calculate even when things become slightly more complex in terms of dependencies but the, the calculations are quite straightforward so mm, only thing you have to calculate when you calculate you have to be patient and you have to calculate uh, terms uh, correctly right so basically if you look at delta cp according to this expression then delta cp is the difference in cp between the epsilon phase and the beta phase between the two coexisting phases which is basically nothing but 
the difference in del the coefficient a difference in the coefficient b times t difference in the coefficient c by t square and difference in the coefficient d times t uh, t square right this is times t square remember this is by t square okay so now if i do from t naught which is say some reference temperature to t d delta h then this is basically delta cpt dt which comes out to be this right so if you do this delta a plus delta b t plus delta c yeah. so then delta h at some temperature t minus delta h at some temperature t naught which is the reference state i can write this as delta a times t delta b times t square by 2 delta and this will be delta c by t square so this is minus delta c by t and delta d by t q uh, delta d into t cube by 3 right and again this has to be put as t and t naught so if i do that so basically i get the I get the change in enth uh, the, the change in enthalpy during the transformation as a function of the coefficients that we have determined experimentally of the of the heat capacities of the coexisting phases. That is here in this case it is epsilon and beta, right? So if I do that, then the relation just becomes and delta v epsilon to beta is nothing but v beta minus v epsilon okay um, uh, right v beta minus v epsilon which is which can be a function of temperature and pressure but we are if we neglect that so this just becomes a constant right because i told that v into 1 minus uh, t alpha you can delta v in 1 minus t alpha can be neglected for a solid liquid um, solid liquid coexistence so then this becomes p minus p naught there is a change in pressure from a reference uh, pressure is equals to this by basically so th this is the delta h by uh, and there is a, a temperature if you remember so if you can see here delta a t was there the t and there is t and t naught and this becomes just delta v epsilon to beta so basically this is coming from this relation what is the relation this relation right you can simplify this relation you can finally write this relation as after integrate obviously after integration so we have to do the integration so basically previously my integration was this right this was my integration where delta h as well as delta v m delta h as well as delta v m were independent of temperature and pressure however if delta h itself is a function of temperature then only thing that changes is the numerator right then the numerator is changing and you have p minus p okay so please check the expression derived by yourself and make sure that you are doing it correctly so that you, if i can also make see if you do this algebra, little bit of algebra sometimes there is always possibility that you can make some mistake here and there you please check it and confirm that what i am getting here when delta h is a function of temperature and pressure and cp is also a function of temperature and pre, uh, temperature right by the way what we told delta h can be a function of temperature and pressure but the pressure term we have neglected so delta h here is a function of temperature but delta h is related to the the heat capacities or the differences in the heat capacities of the two coexisting phases and the the heat capacities also can be functions of temperature so you look at the differences and then you basically plug it in and you get this relation you please check this relation Okay, this is for a more generalized approach. In general, you will often see the problems are such that the temperature ranges are such that the delta H mostly may be independent of uh, temperature and pressure. However, if the temperature range is slightly larger and you have RCP variation, then you have to take into account of that. And basically, if you have even the molar volume variation, that also has to be taken into account. But see, these are calculations and thermodynamics gives you a way to calculate all these changes in the phase boundary. How the phase boundary, instead of becoming linear, becomes curved, you can basically know by just looking at this relation right the relation that you have derived for different systems for example the epsilon to beta transformation in titanium right so that's the idea so again thermodynamic square i just went there and i told you that it's a very very useful tool you can use it but again use it cautiously remember that in the differentials this ne this negative signs that are given here are neglected but in other cases, you have to use this negative signs, right? Say, for example, V, is it negative? No, it is positive. So, I have used positive. Temperature, positive. But DS and DP, whether they are negative or positive, the, the, the signs in the differential is neglected, right? So, this is something that 
is a take home message and you can quickly use this and then uh, use your own strategy see remember there are many books with different strategies they will tell that you do this and then do this and see ultimately all the strategies one important thing is you have to focus on the relation that you want and that you want to use based on what are the parameters that are known to you what are the measurable parameters that are known to you based on that you construct the relation and based on that you come up with an useful relation right so basically there will be different strategies you can follow some strategy some strategies may work in some cases and some strategies may not work in some other cases as a result your strategy should be to look at the final relation look at what are the measurable quantities what are the measurable quantities available based on that how do you approximate all that indirectly measurable quantities whether it is change in enthalpy that is important or it's change in entropy or change in free energy this is something you have to basically looking at the problem uh, in focus you can basically find out which are important quantities now think of liquid vapor boundary so you have alpha is liquid and beta is vapor and you are the process that we are talking about is like evaporation liquid to vapor is like evaporation or boiling and vapor to liquid is like condensation right and again you have this equation now if in general as you know that gas has a much larger molar volume compared to the any condensed phase whether it is liquid or whether it's solid so basically delta vm vaporization is nothing but vm beta where beta is the gaseous phase or the right so so basically you can write this as so so delta vm can be just represented as so basically if i do this then i get delta h vaporization by t vm beta right vm alpha can be neglected now we can think of and many a times it is it is it is it is uh, indeed a very good approximation that beta phase that is the gaseous phase of the vapor phase okay above the liquid is an ideal gas okay is approximated as an ideal gas or a perfect gas then basically it becomes life becomes simpler you get vm beta equal to the molar volume of beta can be expressed in terms of the universal gas constant the temperature right the temperature by by pressure so you have as you can see here vm beta is nothing but rt by p right vm beta is nothing but rt by p right because p vm equals to rt so then dp by dt equals delta h vaporization and t times rt by p so basically if you cal uh, calculate a little bit so it this becomes dp by p right because you see you have rt by p here so p goes up right p goes up so so now this p when i take this p so i'll just write here so dp this implies dp by dt equals to p delta h by r t square right so okay now you integrate so it becomes dln p this becomes dln p and this becomes delta h vaporization by r dt by t square and at t equal to t naught let us assume p equals to p naught that is the reference vapor pressure and at t equal to t is p equal to p and then you do the integral and if you do the integral you have dt by t square so dt by t square is minus 1 by t is the 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 integral right the, the integral is minus 1 by t after you do this integral right and then you put the limits t naught to t then you get minus delta h vaporization by r right this term and again remember we are assuming that delta h vaporization is independent of temperature right it does not change with temperature so basically if i do that again if you want to put uh, put in all the dependence of temperature if the problem demands that you have to do that and again the same recipe the more generalized recipe that i have shown earlier will follow so right now it becomes very easy right it becomes a very easy integration so ln p by p naught where p naught is the reference vapor pressure is given by minus delta h by r 1 by t minus 1 by t naught 
Now look at this consequence. There is a negative sign here and this is delta H of vaporization. So vaporization is a process in which a liquid will absorb it, which is basically an endothermic process. But you have a negative here. So how does the pressure change with temperature? You can basically find out very easily from this expression. Right? Basically, you can further simplify this as P equals to, so you are writing P equals to say for example P naught e to the power minus chi or P naught exponential minus chi, right? This e to the power minus chi is basically you can also write it as exponential. E is nothing but exp, right? So then if you write that way, then as you can see P by P naught equals to exponential of this entire term, right? Exponential of this term. Right, so where chi is nothing but this delta h, so it is e to the power minus chi, right? P zero e to the power minus chi. So chi is nothing but this factor delta h by r, delta h vaporization by r, one by t minus one by t. For solid vapor boundary, you can go the exactly the same way. Here it is solid to vapor sublimation or deposition, and then you get ln p three by p three naught is equals to this. Right, minus delta H sublimation that is a change in transformation again this is we are assuming that delta H sublimation does not depend on temperature uh, but again the vapor phase has a much much bigger molar volume than the solid phase and so you end up with the same equation only thing Ts is that the temperature of interest for uh, this is the transformation temperature of interest right transformation or sublimation temperature of interest and Ts naught is the the temperature at the uh, at the reference state at a reference state and p s not correspondingly is the pressure at the reference state right so now think of triple point right you often see triple points right so basically you have this diagram like this one and then you have this one and this one these are the branches right so these are the branches so if i if i make these uh, guys slightly thicker so you have one branch like this and you have one branch like this and you have one branch like oh see this i will not use a blue color i will use the white color right so only thing uh, here i have drawn a straight line instead of straight line it should be so you can approximate this as a straight line also so if you approximate it as a straight line but if you do not want to approximate that's also fine so you can write this way and think of so this is your right this is your these are your phase boundaries right these are you that the 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 the, the <coughs> Thick lines are your phase boundary. So alpha, beta, I have drawn linear, but if you want, you can make it also. So you have a nonlinearity here, so I can replace that. So I'll put the alpha, beta line here. It is this line. And I can basically so. take this line. So these thicker lines are your right these thicker lines represent your phase boundaries and these extend lines are basically that extension these are like some sort of a you can think of like these are like continuations of this line so this these thick lines are the phase boundaries so the so the yellow thick line as you can see here the yellow thick line represents the phase boundary between alpha and gamma right and this is the alpha plus gamma coexistence right this phase boundary has alpha plus gamma coexistence please note you can you can actually derive the change in the degrees of freedom when you move from the single phase alpha to single phase gamma through this phase boundary right so how the degrees of freedom changes again it is for the alpha plus beta or beta plus gamma this is the beta plus gamma phase boundary so this is beta gamma but see the interesting part here is the triple point so if you look at that there is this triple point where 
this is like a pressure and temperature at which solid liquid and gas coexist so at that point you have degree of freedom as you remember equal to as you remember degree of freedom f equals to c minus p plus 2 c is the number of components in the unary system this one minus number of phases is 3 and plus 2 so this is equal to 0 so the triple point as you as you remember was fixed right but how do you determine it now you see a very interesting idea so you have alpha phase which is your solid phase beta phase which is your liquid phase and gamma phase which is your gaseous phase as you can see solid phase has the uh, uh, lowest the lowest molar volume or low, lowest entropy and your gamma that is the has the highest entropy right so gamma appears here right um, and uh, beta uh, so gamma appears so if you see you have alpha phase here gamma phase here gamma phase is your so this is your beta phase and this is your gamma phase so gamma phase as you can see at higher temperatures gamma phase will be favored because gamma phase is the gaseous phase which has a much higher entropy in this case right so you have now delta v let us assume now a sublimation that is basically from alpha solid phase it is going to gamma phase but we can so that is basically nothing but vm gamma so you can put an m here i am not putting but it is implied it is all part mole is implied okay so basically if i am doing that delta v alpha to gamma which is vm gamma minus vm alpha or v gamma minus v alpha we can write this as as you can see here v gamma we can write this as v gamma minus v beta plus v beta minus v alpha so what i have done i have just written this as v gamma minus so i have just add, added one term minus v beta and then i have to take it out right minus v beta then i do plus v beta minus so it's like i am telling it's a stepwise process okay i am imagining this as a stepwise process one step is gamma to so basically beta to gamma transformation right beta to gamma transformation another is alpha to beta transformation so basically i am telling delta v alpha to gamma so what i am telling is delta v alpha to gamma is going through one process like this which is beta to gamma transformation and this is alpha to beta transformation so basically i am writing this this is basically solid to gas is equal to sol so beta to gamma is like a liquid to gas and this is like solid to liquid so you have solid to liquid liquid to gas which gives you solid to gas transformation now as you know that we that with the, using this uh, minus e to the power minus sky type of idea that you can write the say if this is for the solid vapor equilibrium so ps s indicates sublimation process so you can write ps equals to some coefficient s exponential minus delta h alpha to gamma by rt and liquid vapor equilibrium again you, it is like p vapor equals to a v exponential minus delta h beta to gamma rt right this is alpha to gamma alpha to gamma is alpha is solid gamma is gas right alpha is solid gamma is gas so you have this expression here it is liquid to vapor so it is pv and this is av so i am just using some 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 coefficient here and i am using some superscript here to distinguish between this equation and this equation and you have obviously the main distinction is here right this is delta h alpha to gamma and here it is delta h beta to gamma now at triple point p3 and t3 both these equations are satisfied triple point p3 t3 basically satisfies both these equations so p3 equals to a s times exponential minus delta h alpha to gamma r t3 similarly p3 equals to a v exponential minus delta h beta to gamma right this is the beta to gamma transformation enthalpy by r t3 so i have substituted t by t3 here and p by p3 here similarly here also i can substitute p by p3 and t by t3 because at the triple point all of these are satisfied right solid vapor is satisfied equilibrium is satisfied liquid vapor equilibrium is satisfied solid liquid equilibrium is satisfied right so now if you have this you have a s so as you can see here a s exponential minus this equals to and you see i am not considering all of these i don't have to consider that and as you can see here a s 
exponential so i am doing what i am taking this term and this term to be equal right because this is p3 this is also p3 so these terms are equal so if i do that i get I, a little bit of manipulation i get so basically i do ln s and then this is exponential so ln of exponential is only this term right and there is ln av and this equation so you get rt3 ln s by av because delta h alpha to gamma minus delta h beta to gamma or basically delta h alpha to gamma minus delta h beta to gamma which is basically t3 and as you can see here delta h alpha to gamma delta h beta to gamma if you look at that you can also basically plug in delta h alpha to beta because the same idea for the molar volume the same idea will hold right delta h alpha to gamma because delta h beta to gamma plus delta h alpha to beta right so so if you have that so now if you see you have delta h so if you if you just write say d is the transform so delta h d is delta h alpha to gamma minus delta h beta to gamma right delta h alpha to gamma minus delta h beta to gamma so delta h d l n p3 we just do a little bit of algebraic manipulation so basically you get delta h d l n p3 is nothing but ln a s plus ln a, ln a s to the power minus delta h beta to gamma and ln a v to the power minus plus delta h alpha to gamma you just follow this derivation then you will see that ln p3 to the power this equation equals to ln as to the power this equation so as to the power minus delta h beta to gamma this is plus delta h alpha to gamma so basically this becomes delta h beta to gamma so if i if i rearrange so i have this term here right i have this entire term here in the as the power and here we have this term and you have this term so basically if you separate this out you get p3 okay so you have got t3 basically you have got t3 already right so this is the t3 right and you just do a little bit of algebraic manipulation and you will get p3 as a function of as uh, to the power delta h beta to gamma minus. so basically you are taking the coefficients assume the coefficients are known and the av coefficients are known and assume the heats of transformation from beta to gamma or alpha to gamma beta to gamma is like liquid to gas and alpha to gamma is like solid to gas if we know all these heats of transformation you can also get p3 right you can get p3 okay so that's the idea okay so how do you get it so let us tell so this is exactly so this is one example so remember this is one equation that i have drawn so this is this is an equation that i have derived okay this is one equation that i have derived so you have as you can see you have two equations you have two unknowns so basically if you can basically get t3 you should be able to get p3 right you have two equations right so basically p3s are equal you have made and you got t3 and once you got t3 you plug it back right once you got this t3 expression you plug it back and do a systematics and basically you you, you do some manipulation algebraic manipulation you will get into a p3 right so where as has to be known so the idea is here so if if i give such formula what you are seeing here what is the take home here as has to be known av has to be known and these transformations have to be known now i will tell you a very easy way to estimate the triple point you may not have to so exponentials actually help you here because if you can if you have this exponentials you know that if i can plot log in uh, the p in the log scale things become easier so now think of this one important thing i have to tell you say for example if the liquid is a uh, solid is melting to liquid and a liquid is boiling and it is converting to vapor obviously the boiling point is always going to be higher than the melting point as long as the pressure so here i am talking about an axis if you please note this axis this is like one atmosphere pressure or one bar pressure and this is like one 10 to the power minus 25 bar pressure obviously you can see that this is log scale so you have 10 to the power minus 25 bar pressure very low um, pressure then you have moderately low pressure and this is like the atmospheric pressure i am not going beyond atmospheric pressure you see that now if you look at this atmospheric pressure at atmospheric pressure you know melting point you know boiling point in general at atmospheric pressure the boiling point has to be greater than the melting point okay now one thing delta h alpha to gamma that is delta h this is alpha is basically 
the solid phase to gaseous phase again i can write the same way like in steps of 2 so this is delta h alpha to beta which is basically solid to liquid and this is liquid to gas beta to gas so you have say for example for silicon this is done for silicon so for silicon delta h silicon is this okay 386 kJ per mole okay so this is from liquid to vapor so silicon from liquid to vapor transmission is 386 kJ plus liquid to vapor remember this has to be plus 386 kJ per mole right so it has to it's an endothermic process because liquid has to absorb the heat and convert to vapor like right? liquid has to absorb the heat now this is basically the 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 the, the pressure is one atmosphere and t is 2873 kelvin okay then in that case if, if this is the transmission temperature and then you have av equals to pv right because see what i told is if you look at that pv equals to av exponential this so basically av equals to pv exponential but this minus will become plus that's all right so that's what i have doing done here 